Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to see this uh, turnout. Um, first of all, let me acknowledge that uh, we are on Coast Salish uh, people's traditional territories and privileged to be gathered as such uh, this evening. Um, my name is Andrew Petter. I'm the president of Simon Fraser University, and I'm just delighted to welcome you all to the 2013-14 President's Faculty Lecture Series. This is the final lecture in the series for this academic year. And the President's Faculty Lecture Series is part of a larger initiative that I hope you've heard about called SFU Public Square. Uh, it's really a commitment to the community on the part of SFU to be, as our vision uh, charges us to be, Canada's most community-engaged research university. We very much want to be a university that is there as part of and for the community, not an ivory tower that sits apart from the community. And the opportunity to engage with the community is uh, an important uh, one that we want to uh, take the advantage of wherever we can. So the opportunity to bring some of our best research faculty to the community and have them share with you uh, their ideas, their interests, is part of SFU Public Square. And I encourage you to look on the SFU Public Square website for other dialogues, engagements, workshops. We do an annual summit as well, um, because it's really an attempt by us to be that forum for the community, to really help the community to nurture uh, itself in terms of information, dialogue, and uh, grappling with some of the issues of the day. Uh, I want to also note that this lecture is being filmed for our SFU YouTube channel, so if you want to see it again, or if your friends couldn't make it and want to see it, uh, there'll be a chance for them to, uh, to participate uh, via our YouTube channel and to, and to see the lecture uh, there. So it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's uh, speaker, and some of you may have heard him this afternoon on uh, CBC in the Afternoon Show. Uh, his name is Dr. Peter Dickinson. Dr. Dickinson is a professor in the SFU English Department and has served both as an undergraduate and graduate chair. He's an associate member of the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies, and he also teaches in SFU School uh, for the Contemporary Arts. So you can tell he's got diverse uh, and engaged interests that uh, I'm sure are part of the reason you wanted to be here along with me to hear him this evening. His research interests include theater and performance studies, film studies, queer theory and gender studies, and comparative Canadian literary and cultural studies. He's particularly interested in the connection between art and politics and in what the performing arts can teach us about our relationships with the places in which we live and with the world at large. An active viewer and supporter of arts and culture in Vancouver, Peter is president of the board of the PUSH International Performing Arts Festival and blogs regularly about performance in the city and beyond. He's also author of numerous books and articles and has recently begun writing for the stage. His play, The Objecthood of Chairs, an interdisciplinary work of dance and theater, was produced in 2010 as a collaboration with our School for the Contemporary Arts. So you can tell he's got a lot of interest, and I know a lot to share with us this evening. And with that, I would ask you to please join with me in welcoming Dr. Peter Dickinson. Uh, thank you very much uh, all for coming. It's wonderful to see all my constituencies coming together around <laughs> performance. Um, of course, I've stacked the audience because my students are here. Um, they're collecting an assignment afterwards, so they were, I, I glad they were to come. Um, so uh, I have a slides to show you, and um, many of them are images, some of them are text, and I might go a little too quickly through the, uh, the slides for you to get all of the reading done, but if you are interested, please feel free to email me, and I'd be happy to uh, share them with you. So I just set my clock here, and we'll be on our way. So I would like to begin tonight's lecture with a brief montage of descriptive scenes. In the first, an actor playing a weary and recently chastened patriarch moves downstage to deliver a monologue, summing up a lifetime of regret and the pain he has unfairly inflicted on his steadfast wife, or his embittered son, or his dead daughter. Take your pick of the plays from the Western canon. In the second scene, 
A politician has called a press conference to apologize for his latest indiscretion, admitting that he has let voters down and swearing that it will never happen again. The third scene is set on a beach. It's a glorious summer's day, and two men dressed in identi identically in casual chinos and white linen shirts are reciting before an assembled group of family and friends the vows they have written for each other as a smiling marriage commissioner waits to pronounce them husband and husband. In the fourth scene, a supercilious sommelier at an upscale restaurant presents an expensive bottle of Italian red wine to the male half of an opposite sex couple having a business dinner. The man corrects the sommelier, indicating that it is the woman who should be tasting the wine. And as she does so, the sommelier babbles on about the notes of leather and cherry. The woman interrupts him with a curt nod and asks him to decant the bottle. In the fifth and final scene, a university professor recites the previous four scenes as part of what he hopes will be a witty, accessible, and engaging <laughs> opening to a public lecture on performance. For it is the matter of performance, what it is and why it's important, that not only constitutes the subject of my talk this evening, but also the connection between the scenes I have just described. By that I mean that each of the scenes is composed of human behavior that has been learned and rehearsed and that is now being repeated as part of a specific ritual event that has been framed in time and that plays out in front of an audience. An audience, moreover, whose belief in the performance is sustained in no small measure through the performer's own belief, whether fictional or real, in the part he or she is playing. Although I was trained as a literary critic, the bulk of my research falls into the interdisciplinary academic field known as performance studies. Whenever I tell this to non-PS people, and we have our own lingo, we say that, PS people, non-PS people, um, whether inside the academy or out, the first response is usually, oh, so you mean you study theater, which indeed I do, along with dance, multimedia performance, film and video installation, and just generally the entire spectrum of live and mediatized art. However, I have also researched and published on the politics of same-sex marriage, civil memorials and urban planning, mega sporting events like the Olympics, even the spectacle of extreme weather that results from climate change. So my answer now when people ask me what I do is to say that I study the time and place-based relationships between audience and event. Such a description covers discrete performances of dance and theater that appear for a limited run on city stages and that are seen by a select group of people before disappearing. But it also applies to performance-based phenomena with longer event horizons and multiple, often dispersed and differently invested audiences, like an Olympics. What might at first strike many of you as the rather haphazard kitchen sink approach I have taken to my scholarly career, and that happens to many of us, is in fact a reflection not just of the intensely interdisciplinary nature of performance studies as a field of research inquiry, it is also an indication of just how ubiquitous is the idea of performance in our society. Indeed, when you think about it, we apply the word to a startling array of activities and events. Sticking with the example of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, we have learned to refer to participants in each as high-performance athletes and to wor worry whether or not they, along with competitors and other sporting events, are taking performance-enhancing drugs. And there's a way in which the whole Lance Armstrong uh, saga, of course filtered through the frames of Oprah Winfrey, uh, reads very much like a classic Greek tragedy. Then, too, there are the performances of civic, national, and ethno-cultural pride that routinely attend the games by elaborately staged opening and closing ceremonies and various artistic and cultural events that serve as an adjunct to the sports competitions, as well as to imprint a host city's performance brand upon the global imagination. Finally, as part of the more recent Olympics, there are even officially sanctioned protest zones where one can perform one's dissent to the event should anyone be watching. I'm sure you all noticed the, the dissent in Sochi. But we needn't stop there. Think about how an apparently benign term like performance review has come to structure and in effect instrumentalize virtually all professional and social relationships in our cult culture, from how well we do in the workplace to how we <clears throat> stack up in the bedroom. 
On a scale of one to five, with high, five being the highest and one being the lowest, indicate whether you are or not you are highly satisfied with the candidate's performance, very satisfied, moderately satisfied, satisfied, or unsatisfied. They don't call these things survey monkeys for nothing. Um, as performance studies scholar John McKenzie has compellingly argued in his book, Perform or Else, both high tech and global financial companies operate within a performance management paradigm, one expressly structured around efficiency and payoff, or at least the appearance of the latter. And it behooves us to know about and to understand how this corporate model of a quality perf performance assessment operates, as it has increasingly been used to measure not just the impacts of what in Richard Florida's enterprise discourse we have come to call the creative economy, but also the intellectual and applied social impacts of the kinds of research on performance that someone like me does. In other words, performance as I have so far been using the term is not just a metaphor. It has material effects and moreover requires an analytical framework that is able to account for the meaningfulness of those effects. Performance studies is that framework, one that takes into account both the materiality of performance, the objects that comprise it, the labor that goes into it, the physical sites that give shape to it, and its consequentiality. In short, what performance does. This focus on doing means that performance studies understands all human action, from how we talk to our friends, to deciding what to wear to school, to be eventful and inherently performative. Relatedly, performance studies considers any social or ceremonial ritual, from sharing a meal with family, to genuflecting before a religious or royal figure, to be worthy of analysis as performance. The point of comparison for each of these performances is not their vastly different content, but rather the shared aspects of what anthropologist Victor Turner has called their structure and anti-structure. How they are composed, prepared, and presented, and most importantly, what this might tell us about the individual group or culture that enacts them. By their performances, you shall know them, Turner famously declared, in the process articulating a, a definition of humankind as homo performans. The forms of doing that have come to be read as performances within PS programs in Canada, the US, and internationally are drawn, there's some contestation about this, but these are the ones I'm claiming, uh, are drawn primarily from four main fields of study as they intersected and influenced each other in the 1980s. And I've represented them here on this sort of um, intersecting circle diagram, primarily to show you that I can perform social science models of knowledge <laughs> presentation as well. <laughs> Um, and that's the reason for my graphic, basically. <laughs> um, at the core of performance studies formation, there was and still remains theater studies, broadly defined, focused as it is on the history and theory, the production and reception of dramatic action, broadly defined once again on stage. The second important field to consider in the constitution of performance studies is anthropology, and even more specifically, ethnography which in its focus on the culture and community and group identity creating capacities of what Turner called social dramas, specific calendrical or cultural rites of passages, everyday practices of self, these social dramas drew scholars' attention not just to the theatrical frame structuring virtually all customary activity, but also those structuring the observation of that activity. I am lumping literary studies, I'll come back to my graphic in just a bit, and speech communication studies together as the third disciplinary nexus in performance studies constitution for two reasons. First, before using philology and subsequently new critical textual inquiry as means to shore up its empiricist, linguistic, and literary bona fides in an increasingly hard research-oriented university in the early half of the 20th century, my discipline, the discipline of English studies, also encompassed what was referred to as the drama vocational training in speech, elocution, oratory, and bodily comportment. As Shannon Jackson and Julia Walker have reminded us, this early shared history is something we would do well to keep in mind in the context of how the expressly performative registers of speech and the body, the vocal and pantomimic signifying systems of intonation and gesture that always accompany verbal communication, how these have continued to ghost post-structuralist literary theory that since Jacques Derrida has prioritized the citational system of writing. Which brings me to the second relevant point, 
um, uh, of connection and tension between literature and speech, namely speech act theorist J.L. Austin's influential formulation of the term performative to describe the class of words which, in their saying, also do something. I declare this couple legally married. As chancellor of this university, I admit these students into their various degrees, and so on. There are all sorts of conditions that had to be met, according to Austin, for linguistic performatives of this sort to be successful, not the least of which is the authority of the speaker to say them. I'm not Carol Taylor. I can't admit you into your degrees. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> you still have to write your final paper for me. Um, as well, uh, key is the sincerity of the speaker, which is why he actually, that is Austin, dismissed theatrical utterance from discussion, and which is why he would never consider, ever consider, an apology from Rob Ford to be performatively <laughs> successful. This is also why the measure of the performative sincerity of a state apology of the sort made by Stephen Harper in Parliament regarding residential schools becomes so consequential. As my colleague Sophie McCall, one of her recent graduate students, David Gartner, and scores of indigenous artists and activists in Canada have rightly asked, in the wake of immediate material action to redress the legacies of residential school abuse, how meaningful can we judge Harper's apology delivered six years ago to have been? Ditto any of the art recommendations from Wally Opal's Murdered and Missing Women inquiry, a particular performance of cultural forgetting to which I will return. Finally, drawing in part on all of the other disciplines, we also have the important contributions of gender and sexuality studies to performance studies. In particular, we derive from this field, and especially the highly influential work of scholar Judith Butler, the notion that gender and sexuality, or any other identity category for that matter, are not biologically or chromosomally given, but rather are socially and culturally produced through the repetition of different gendered acts over time. For example, um, that men wear pants and women wear skirts, which is actually anatomically counterintuitive when you think of it. And um, uh, mercifully, we have Mark Jacobs, David Beckham, and our own SFU pipe band to remind us of this fact. Uh, via their rep repetition, these gendered acts become regarded as normative and canonical, much like a classic play repeated uh, over and over in its successive restagings, restagings becomes part of the theatrical repertoire. So in this schema, to go back to my graphic, what theater studies gives to anthropology, gender studies, and literary speech act studies is a structural framework, those classic Aristotelian unities of time, place, and action, through which to record and analyze the ritual repetition of various norms of aesthetic representation, social relation, and political recognition as well as those liminal or threshold moments when those norms are temporarily, neg temporarily negated or suspended. And we are presented with the possibility, in Butler's terms, of doing things differently. In turn, what the other disciplines give to theater studies is a critical paradigm to leverage against the anti-theatrical, anti-mimetic bias that from Plato to Austin and beyond has aligned stage performance with fakery and falsehood. Reconceiving, in Turner's words, uh, performance as making and not faking, poesis rather than mimesis, provides us with a way not just of valuing the material and bodily labor that goes into the production of theater and live art more generally. Right, Fojan? Right, Mark? Uh, but also of accounting for the performativity of these performances, what these aesthetic acts do, and why they are consequential. And I mean this not just in terms of the possible new worlds and forms of social intimacy they can model for us on stage. I mean this also in terms of the ways in which the very ephemerality of performance, its contingency, asks an audience to ponder reflexively the ways in which we are obliged to each other as a public, whose attachments and interests are temporary and discretionary. You're all going to disperse after my talk, but for the moment we are here together attending this lecture as a public. So these, uh, these bonds are, are temporary, to be sure, but they're also embodied, affectively adhesive and nervously responsive. In other words, alive to the situatedness of what it is we are experiencing. In this regard, it is worth remembering a dictum from the influential performance ethnographer Dwight Conkergood, that performance research takes both its subject matter and method 
the experiencing body situated in time, place, and history. This statement forces us to reconsider not just the ways in which we conduct our research, but also the ways in which that research is disseminated and evaluated. And that last little bit was for all the senior administrators in the audience. Uh, given that, as I've just suggested, performance and performance studies is about making and not faking, poesis rather than mimesis, it should come as no surprise that practice-based research methods have become such a defining feature of the field. Thus, for example, my colleague in anthropology, Dara Culhane, has combined historical and literary scholarship, extensive archival research, and interviews with relatives of her father and grandmother, the Irish actress and elocutionist Mary Shee, into a hybrid performance of ethnographic writing and dramatic storytelling, Hear Me Looking at You, that addresses important questions about exile and home, imagination, and memory. Similarly, my colleague in explorations and world literature, Sasha Colby, has just completed a project called Staging Modernist Lives, in which she combines archival research, textual analysis, and solo performance scripts to critically investigate autobiographical writing of the avant-garde within the social, political, and artistic currents of modernism. Both professors Culhane and Colby are working at the nexus of current critical discussions in performance studies on the relationships between textual archives and bodily repertoires, and on what Rebecca Schneider has characterized as the remains of performance in archives, and how those remains are ritually reenacted through the researcher's live bodily encounter with them in the performative space of the archive itself. We tend to think of researchers going into archives, we erase the body when they go into archives. They're just doing research. But in fact, the body is there alive to those remains, um, Schneider suggests. Uh, meanwhile, in contemporary arts, my colleague Henry Daniel places his choreographic practice, as well as his interest in intermedial performance technologies, at the center of his investigations into questions of identity, storytelling, and various forms of knowledge transmission across different temporal periods, geographical spaces, and cultural communities. And finally, I have attempted to investigate dance and physical theaters at times complementary, at times divergent relationships to language and text by collaborating with colleagues in contemporary arts on a multidisciplinary work of dance theater. Thinking about performance, its creation, its reception, its research as fundamentally in Conquer Good's terms about the experiencing body situated in time, place, and history has also meant that it has become increasingly important to anchor my research in the performance networks, environments, and contexts specific to Vancouver and British Columbia. In this, I see my work participating in a large, larger scholarly conversation on performance and the city and on the differently scaled local and global interfaces between audience and event. It is this dynamic between performance and place that I wish to make the central matter of the remainder of this lecture, and in the process I hope give you a glimpse into some of my current research projects. Performance, I submit, is uniquely situated to comment on the politics of place and placelessness, because while it unfolds before an audience that has come together in a specific time and space, the fact that so much of it is also non-object oriented and non-commodity based means that perforce it also disappears. Thus, according to the French philosopher Alain Badieu, who's also a playwright, which is great, uh, the extent to which performance can foster a, what he calls a place-based consciousness depends very much on what remains of the local, specifically local, specificity of a performance as an eventual site. This holds true as much for a locally produced work of site-specific theater, excavating, let's say, the buried social history of an inner city neighborhood, as for the globally marketed mega event that contributes, whether temporarily or permanently, to the disappearance of part of that neighborhood. Um, and indeed, as I've outlined in a transnational comparison of the preparations for the Beijing 2008 Summer Games and the Vancouver 2010 Winter Games in the first chapter of my last book, Mega events like Olympics have built into them a structural paradox of place performance. While conscripting local artists and cultural workers to produce representative images of spectacularized place for global export, Olympic organizers also must flatten, usually for television, and make placeless those images in order for them to be recognizable within the universally transposable genre of spectacle. 
Um, you might have gathered uh, from listening to how often they've come up so far that I haven't exactly gotten over the Vancouver 2010 Olympics yet. Um, and in fact, I'm collaborating uh, with my colleagues, Dr. Christy Johnson and Dr. Karen Zaints, um, on an upcoming conference about the role of the arts in the production of urban mega events with a specific focus on the cultural legacies of the Vancouver 2010 and the London 2012 Summer Olympic and Paralympic Games. Coincident with this collaborative investigation on the post-Olympics performance and cultural legacies of Vancouver and London, I have also recently begun a series of case studies using place as an analytical paradigm to examine the cultural, economic, and social asymmetries embedded within performances of cityness locally, nationally, and transnationally. These case studies, as I have so far conceived them, will unfold gyroscopically articulating a performative politics of location focused to begin with on material sites of inquiry particular to Vancouver before gradually moving outward to connect these sites to other material spaces via national and hemispheric comparisons. I've begun this project from an extremely localized, doubly insider institutional perspective using my positions as SFU faculty member and current president of the PUSH board to explore the evolving relationship between the PUSH festival and the SFU Woodward's complex, examining some of the former's programming in the context of the latter building's uh, place-based identity within Vancouver's downtown east side, which, believe it or not, I explore in part via the two front doors um, to the Woodward's building, and you can ask me about that later if you want. Um, the process by which I then seek to extend the place-based frames of comparative performance analysis in this project can be seen in another case study that I am just in the process of completing. In it, I begin by drawing on the scholarship of Diana Taylor to explore how performance works by indigenous artists like Marie Clements, Yvette Nolan, and Rebecca Belmore have responded to the femicide of Aboriginal women in Vancouver and BC. However, I then go on to place those works in hemispheric relation to other performances of cultural memory dedicated to murdered and missing indigenous women of the Americas, focusing in particular on a series of installation and videos by mestiza artist Teresa Margolas that take as both their implicit and explicit subject the epidemic of sexual and gendered violence in Juarez, Mexico. In so doing, I argue that all of these artists' remembering of the terms by which these women's apparently insignificant lives were lived is positioned deliberately aslant local media's sole spectacular interest in the eventfulness of their deaths. So let me conclude this talk um, by taking a closer look at why this matters, starting with an examination of a performance by Belner, Belmore that I have written about extensively and that has haunted me for more than 10 years. Uh, in June 2002, celebrated Anishinaabe artist Rebecca Belmore, who was Canada's representative to the Venice Biennale in 2005, mounted the site-specific performance vigil as part of the Talking Stick Festival. Planting herself on the corner of Gore and Cordova streets, Belmore, clad in faded blue jeans and a white undershirt, begins the performance with a ritual cleansing of the material space of remembrance, donning pink rubber gloves and getting down on her hands and knees with a bucket of soapy water to scrub away trace signs of the collective detritus of three squares of sullied urban sidewalk and adjacent street. Graffiti, garbage, saliva, urine, used chewing gum, used condoms, used needles, used women. Belmore's labor embodies several layers of transcultural meaning. At a very basic level, she is making publicly visible the often invisible and underpaid domestic work carried out by hundreds of thousands of women of color across the Americas in hotel rooms and restaurants and offices and private homes every day. Labor that sustains our urban economies in essential ways. At the same time, the cleansing of this particular outdoor space, the site of many of Robert Picton, Picton's abductions, calls attention to the parallel and equally exploitative sexual economy into which many of these women are forced in order to make ends meet. Part of the downtown east side's notorious stroll, this sidewalk is always already marked as distasteful in the minds of many audience audience onlookers. However, the scrupulous care with which Belmore carries out her cleaning of its surface, her actions patient, methodical, attentive, makes it clear that in her mind, what is most in need of purification is not the bodies of the women who worked here, but the violent and unreported crimes perpetrated against them. 
Belmore herself re-embodies the social and sexual stratification of this no-go zone of the city via the imprinting in felt-tip pen on her arms of the first names of several of these women. Following her cleansing of the street space, the artist begins lighting a series of votive candles in their memory, eventually ceding this large job to an audience member, a telling indication of the scale of the trauma she is commemorating. However, this trauma is communicated most viscerally to the audience when Belmore starts to yell out the names on her arms, drawing roses replete with thorns through her lips and teeth after each ecstatic invocation. As Charlotte Townsend Galt has written of this moment, quote, in the performance, crimes against the body, the native body, the woman's body, are embodied in, enacted by, or inscribed on her own body, as if in an act of atonement, end quote. However, I would argue that far from letting anyone off the hook through a beneficent gesture of grace, the violence of Belmore's actions with the roses is actually designed to call our attention to how the pain associated with the events being memorialized continues and will not cease without larger structural change in society. Through her repeated destruction of one of the most potent symbols of romantic love, Belmore not only incarnates the willful consumption of indigenous women's bodies within a system of institutionalized racism and sexism, she also implicates the viewer through our failure to intervene against this destruction. Each time the artist looks at her arm and raises another clutch of cut roses to her mouth, we are aware of the bodily hurt that will ensue, but we don't do anything. Vigil concludes with Belmore donning a bright red dress that she then nails methodically to a nearby telephone pole. In the subsequent struggle to free herself, the fabric of the dress is torn from her body bit by bit. Her dispossession and disabille in the moment of performance's own disappearance, standing in for the tattered remains and what remains in tatters of the lives of so many women so many of us in the audience had long ago forgotten. Once she is fully free from the dress, um, standing again in her jeans and undershirt, Belmore makes her way to a nearby pickup truck we had not previously noticed. As James Brown's It's a Man's 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 World starts to blare from the truck radio, Belmore climbs into the passenger seat. Then the truck suddenly speeds away and we are left to ruminate uncomfortably on a final shocking irony. As the lyrics to the Brown song remind us, the taken-for-granted certainty of the triple masculine possessive in its title depends on a double negation, a necessary absenting of feminine presence, if you remember the line that comes next. But it wouldn't mean nothing, nothing without a woman or a girl. When the video of the performance was included as part of Belmore's 2003 solo exhibition, The Named and the Unnamed, at the Morris and Helen Belkin Art Gallery at the University of British Columbia, its installation included a unique sculptural feature that doubled as a cognitive prompt and a visual impediment to the viewer. The screen on which the video was projected was dotted with several dozen small light bulbs. Scott Watson summarizes the effect, quote, the light bulbs might be metaphorical extensions of the candles Belmore lights and visual. They create an unusual optical effect, dividing a viewer's perception so that we can see simultaneously the depth of field in the space of the projections and also upon its surface. The lights are figuratively in our way, disrupting our vision the way the memory of these women ought to trouble our conscience." End quote. The labor required to see what is on the screen is literally registered upon our bodies, as with days, retinas, and heads bobbing side to side and up and down, we struggle to take in the full dimensions of Belmar's performance. But as the reflexive memory of such movements in any number of social, cultural, and institutional situations and spaces, not least the gallery, should remind us, it is possible to look and still not see. And indeed, at the heart of the ongoing tragedy that is the story of the murdered and missing Aboriginal women of British Columbia is a truth that it is as hard to assess socially and politically as it is forensically. How can you register that someone has disappeared if you never noticed her in the first place? Even when these women became faces with names on a poster, most of us looked but refused to see. In other words, in her memorializing of these women's barely registered deaths, in which their official archival remains exist only as a name in a coroner's report or at best a grainy photo in a newspaper, Belmore is giving material embodiment to the diversity and vibrancy and complexity of their lived experiences within the repertory space of live performances. She is telling us why these women continue to matter. 
And once we are placed within the ethical frame of such a scenario, it is incumbent upon us to take note of to see its distressingly familiar structures and patterns. And within the plot of the Americas, our depth of field must be truly expansive. Only in this way will we be able to connect a dirty sidewalk in Vancouver's skid row to the skid marks left by tires along a highway in northern British Columbia, as well as to the ghostly reminders, the remainders, of Las Feminichidos in the northern Mexican town of Juarez. I refer here to the border city in Chihuahua that became infamous in the 1990s for a wave of violent attacks against local young women that left hundreds, potentially thousands, dead over the course of the decade. Most of the cases remained unsolved and the violence has continued. More women were killed in the first half of 2012 in Juarez than in any year of the so-called, earlier year of the so-called femicide era. Mexican, uh, Mestiza Mexican artist Teresa Margolis has attempted to capture something of the scale of the violence in Juarez in the specific context of its spectacular reproduction in the media in her installation PM 2010 created for the 7th Berlin Biennale in 2012. In this large-scale, wall-mounted piece, Margolis displays in sequential order all 313 covers published by Juarez's main daily newspaper in 2010. Each one features an image of a victim of drug or sexual violence. Framed by the familiar layout and recognizable typography of the tabloid format with its bold red type and supersized font, which you can't see very well here, I apologize. Um, the images are simultaneously flattened, pointing to, the, pointing to the ways such violence in Juarez has become routine and normalized through its endly, endless repetition, and also made to seem almost pornographic. Telling in this regard is the fact that another standard feature on many of the covers is the image of a scantily clad young woman next to the crime scene photos her body made available for what Margolis, like Belmore, suggests is the real focus of our twin appetites for sex and death. The forensic component of PM 2010 is a recurring feature in Margolis' work. A founding member of the radical art collective Semifo, Servicio Medico Forense, she has been creating art from the material and memorial traces of death in Mexico and Latin America for more than two decades. Margolis, who has a diploma in forensic medicine, in addition to her art school credentials, has displayed hospital linens containing the blood and bodily fluids of murder victims, filled a fish tank with 240 liters of the water used to wash the corpses in the Mexico City mortuary, where she actually worked for a time, photographed the sutured autopsy incisions on the bodies of victims of violence, and perhaps most famously, used coolers, humidifiers, and bubble-making machines to fill different gallery spaces with the liquid traces of the dead. R. Scott Bray has written of Margolis's art that she uses, quote, the fundamental matter of death decomposed to com comment on the, quote, social violence and anonymity attending the poor and marginalized within the state and economic structures of Mexico and Latin America. It is in her works dealing with the specific context of Juarez that Margolis reveals her deepest engagements with the performance of indigenous women's cultural memory in the Americas, and by extension, the aesthetic and political sensibilities she shares with Belmar, Belmore. For a 2005 exhibition in Zurich simply called Ciudad Juarez, Margolis displayed on the floor of the gallery a series of handmade adobe bricks she had produced from sand collected from places in and around Juarez where the corpses of sexually abused women had been found. Evoking headstones that mark burial sites, the, the, uh, the stone sentinels, like the votive candles Belmore lit in vigil, stand as memorials to the murdered women. But without names to identify the dead, epitaphs to distinguish and personalize their lives, or indeed actual graves to complete the work of mourning, the bricks in their sameness, their combined weight and their mute opacity, also speak to the biolitical expendability of these women in transnational institutional structures of government, law, and economy. Margolis accompanies the stones with a video called Lote Bravo, Lomas de Polio, Anapra Cristo Negro. It shows looped footage of a car ride through the dusty desert roads and byways that so many of the women in Juarez travel on their way to and from work. As Bray has noted, following the ratification of NAFTA in 1994, 
Juarez, in large part because of its proximity to the US border, saw an explosion in maquiladoros, factories set up by American corporations for the cheap assembly of prefabricated industrial parts with, that would then be shipped back to the United States for sale. Although these factories provided legitimate employment outside the drug trade for hundreds of Juarez's citizens, the long hours, shift work, and distance of the factories from the center of town also left many female maquillas vulnerable to assault. In the same way that Belmore embedded within her washing of the sidewalk at the start of vigil, a subtle critique of North American domestic labor's traffic in the bodies of indigenous women, here Margolis is suggesting that the continental drift of industrial capital licenses a similar model of consumption, disposal, and denial. Coincidentally, in the summer of 2013, just last year, Belmore and Margolis were both part of a group show at the National Gallery of Canada called Sakahan, an Algonquin word meaning to light the fire, that was billed as the largest ever exhibition of international indigenous art. Belmore's contribution on the top, Fringe, is a large photographic light box displaying a semi-nude reclining woman. Across the length of her back runs a scar from the stitches of which bleeds, uh, of which ceremonial beating weeps instead of blood. Margolis's contribution, Telebordada, is a white blanket that had been wrapped around the body of a mur murdered Mayan woman from Guatemala. Onto its surface, mixing with the blood stains of the murdered woman, Margolis and other indigenous activist women from the Atitlan region of Guatemala, who are featured in an accompanying video, have sewn a tapestry of brightly colored commemorative images from Mayan visual culture, including flowers and birds and candles. At once intensely beautiful and suggestive of the restorative and healing power that so often at attends the collective memory work built into indigenous women's textile traditions, these pieces by Belmore and Margolis nevertheless are records of past bodily violence. And this is another way that the commemorative art practices of Belmore and Margolis are performative. Going back to J.L. Austin, their ritual performances are not purely symbolic, they are also functional even deliberately instrumentalist. Like the Madres de Plaza de Mayo who gathered every Thursday in the central square of Buenos Aires during the height of Argentina's dirty war, Belmore and Margolis in their performances of bereavement create a form of memory theater that politically admonishes the inaction of various state apparatuses. Moreover, because of the fluidity, fluidity and unpredictability of, of spectatorship, whether live or virtual, their performative commemoratives open up a social conversation about the role of memory in constituting newly activist performance publics. Now, in making these kinds of comparisons at the end of this talk, I do not, do not mean to homogenize indigenous women's cultural memories in the Americas or to suggest that these performances are only about victimization. I merely wish to point out, in Taylor's words, some of the ways that performance studies can, quote, help us address rather than deny structures of intercultural indecipherability, end quote. Not least as those structures are determined by and might be productively analyzed through different place-based relationships of scale between body, home, community, city, region, nation, hemisphere, globe. Let me conclude then by bringing things back to the very material place of my own university in this equation both in terms of the opportunities it has afforded me to conduct my research and the commitment it has made to engaging in questions of place and community. Consider in this regard one final image from Belmore. It hung in the window of the O'Dane Gallery at SFU Woodward's in February 2010, part of the gallery's inaugural show, First Nations, Second Nature, and time to coincide with the cultural programming that accompanied the Winter Olympics. See, there they are again. <laughs> Belmore's work, called Sister, is a life-size photographic triptych in color showing, like fringe, a young woman from behind, except in this case the woman is fully clothed, clad in blue jeans, a jean jacket, and a hoodie. One hip is cocked defiantly, or is it defensively, to the right. Both arms are stretched out to the sides, as if the woman is about to be frisked, or worse still, crucified. The color of the woman's hair uh, in Belmore's photograph, and the exposed skin of her hands identify her as Aboriginal. But then again, why do I say this with such authority? Is it simply because I know that the artist is an Indigenous woman, or that the work is part of an exhibit of First Nations art? Both questions are less important, I submit, 
than the social and institutional contract context for the photographs display, a gallery in the downtown east side, which necessarily overdetermines our reception of its content. Crucially, we cannot see the subject's face in Belmore's photograph, a fact that perfectly encapsulates the paradox of public invisibility most Aboriginal women confront, not just in Vancouver's downtown east side, but throughout the Americas, exposed to too much scrutiny in certain contexts and not enough in others. As Dara Colhane has argued, the Women's Memorial March held every Valentine's Day in Vancouver since 1991, even despite Van Ock's attempts to cancel it and reroute it in 2010, is an attempt to remedy the imbalance built into this equation, relocating not just when and where Aboriginal women will be seen, but how and on whose terms they will be remembered. One of the things memorial marchers would have seen in February 2010 as they headed along West Hastings to Victoria Squ Victory Square was the image by Belmore. And through the temporal and spatial intersection of both of these place-based performance scripts, we are witness to why, separately and together, they matter. Thanks very much. Well, there's a chance now for uh, you to ask some questions or offer some comments, and I will uh, make myself as useful as I can by getting around with a microphone so we can capture those uh, for the, the video and people who watch in later. So who would like to pose the first uh, question or, uh, or comment to Peter? Der Stund, <laughs> as my mother-in-law likes to say. <laughs> Over here. I'm Hi. Michelle. Hi, <laughs> thank you, I really enjoyed that. Um, I was curious about your research you mentioned uh, for our school, you focused on both of the doors. Mm. Would you mind expanding on that a little bit or? Um, yeah, so yeah. the address of SFU Woodward's is 149 West Hastings. But how many of us go in through that entrance? Not very many, right? So we are, there's a way, and why, I mean, there's a way in which, I mean, the beautiful atrium, the Stan Douglas photograph, all of those sorts of things um, uh, kind of draw us to that entrance. But it's interesting to me that um, I think on the one hand, the, 140, the address is important and, and kind of signifies the building's location in the downtown east side. But there's a way in which we all, structurally, materially, the building turns its back on the downtown east side. You can go from the car park to Woodward's without having to encounter you know, the community, as it were, right? And that's the side that's more uh, directed towards Gastown. Um, we, let's call it the more tu touristic part of the downtown east side. Um, and you know, I mean, I, I totally support us being there. And I support the Van City Office of Cultural Engagement and the fantastic work it's doing, including with interns like Carla and, um, and so on and so forth. Um, but, and I think that um, to a certain extent, that, that's the way the building was built. But it's interesting to work through that like to think through the architecture in terms of the the, uh, the place of the building um, and the cultural work that the what, that what goes on in that building is doing vis-a-vis -vis the community. Over here. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, just to give you a little more context to talk a bit more perhaps about Belmore's work, it was commissioned for the show as well, so it wasn't the existing work that was asked for. Right. The curator, Sabina Bitter, asked for Rebecca Belmore to do a work that was specifically would address that architectural back turning towards mm. Hastings Street. And another thing I think that's, um, that ties into, your, into that spatial analysis that you have of that work actually is that there's a, there was a work also alongside that piece in the show, that was from the American artist Sam Durant, there was a reproduction of a 1970s American Indian movement sign that said, show some respect, you're on Indian land. Mm. And that was purposely put against the window as well. So you had a, an interesting inside, uh, inside and um, outside movement happening there where, where the street was trying to be brought into the gallery, the gallery out to the, right. out to the street, but also in terms of that nice scalar reading that you've been doing of these artworks, right. um, that there was a hemispheric mm -hmm. discussion happening between indigenous movements and also, a, a, let's say, a trans-historical one as well, as there's a discussion between contemporary First Nations struggles here with the American Indian movement right. from the 70s. Yeah. 
Um, and just uh, thank you very much for that, Jeff. And just to say the, the, the work that this is a part of, um, uh, the theater artist of that, Nolan, um, I take into account her work, Annie May's Movement, which brings in AMI, AIM as well in, in the context of those. Yeah. So I mean, it's, it, it's really interesting to think about those in terms of how they force us to reconfigure our own borders, right? And where we draw lines between nations. Thanks. Anyone else? Back, back here. We won't hear you without it. All right. Hi there. I was at um, Rebecca Belmore's performance um, outside the fire hall, and I too have been haunted. I can't walk past the fire hall without the images so poignant in my mind. And um, one of the things that happened is there was a woman far in the distance who called out, and I'm certain that you would or I'm guessing that you would remember that. Mm. And I'm curious how that has percolated in your mind as you've thought through in, uh, that performance. Um, yeah. Um, I guess it's, as, a, as a kind of further haunting um, to a certain extent. I mean, there's, it's interesting, right? I mean, this is, I mean, just to sort of take it outside of the specifics of, um, of the content of that performance, um, this is an interesting issue around site-based work, and I have a graduate student who's working on this very subject, is um, the extent to which uh, the work recognizes the site, which I think Rebecca Belmore is doing, but also to a certain extent takes the proscenium with it outside and, you know, erects a frame that conditions how we receive that material. So we are, we, most of us, me, I sat, stood there passively, um, shattered on the inside, but just watching it, consuming it to a certain extent. And I think um, those sight, those interruptions, let's call them from outside the frame, that should to a certain extent, um, in Taylor's terminology, place us even further ethically inside the scene, um, uh, we kind of filter out um, and, and uh, ignore. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if those are the right terms, but um, how it's, it, it becomes an issue of how to assimilate it within the performance as we've been trained to watch it, I think. I'm not sure if you, if you want to comment further on how, how you... You saw my face when you said ignore. Um, to me, it, it, uh, it further dramatized the, uh, the performance itself. It wasn't a performance, it was more live. Mm. That's an excellent way of putting it. Thank you. Anyone else? Over here. Just give me a minute. I'm not that fast. <laughs> Rodri, is that a specially commissioned HBC code? <laughs> How did you I'll get that color? I'll talk about that later. Uh, to be, be serious, that, that was a really fascinating and highly astute talk. Can I get you to talk a little bit more about another place-based continuous ceremony which crosses over with this? It, the differences between performance and ritual, because running through it, I was fascinated with the reference to various forms of ritual that mm -hmm. were coming in. So I wondered if you could say a bit more about that. Right. Um, well, I, it, ritual is very much at the heart of, of performance studies, um, as you know, it has sort of been created, as it were, by Richard Schechner and, and Victor Turner. So in, in their scheme, there is this continuum um, uh, from everyday performances uh, through uh, social rituals, um, so marriage ceremonies, coming of age ceremonies, religious coming of age ceremonies, um, uh, uh, various rituals um, that uh, signify your um, admission into a community, and so on and so forth, of which, uh, to go back to my example, uh, graduating from university is, is one such ritual, and we respect and honor um, those rituals, uh, but I think what, um, what becomes interesting is, is to sort of think through different kinds of performances through that framework, right? Um, so there are various rituals that are associated with a lecture like this, and um, that you're all focused in rows like this with me sitting very quietly and attentively and, and all of those sorts of things. And um, uh, what happens when something shifts the paradigms associated with those rituals? And as a teacher, I see that over and over again. So technology in the classroom changes my pedagogical ritual uh, daily, 
Um, and so I think it becomes, uh, it, it becomes interesting how, um, and this is what, this is Turner's point about homo performance, is what does it mean to actually think through uh, human history through a framework of ritual, through a framework of performance and how those um, things, um, to think at the micro level of events rather than the macro level of, you know, sweep, you know, historical change, those paradigm shifts um, that are the way we come to understand cultural change. So I guess that my, my point would be, I guess, ritual particularizes, um, should focus and drill us down um, to the specific. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Peter. Thank you very much. Um, I just wonder if you would go back a moment to, to your diagram. Mm. Um, which I know had to be oversimplified. Oh, yeah, uh, I'm going to get it from you. I know what's missing. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 um, but I, I just want you to reflect. I'm not trying to correct you or anything, so don't worry about that. I'm just asking you to reflect on the fact that you showed performance art pieces. They are right. Rebecca Belmore is mm. known for many things, and one of them is be for being a performance artist. Right. But art doesn't have a place in your circles, and I'm wondering right. how that fits in, or does it belong in each and every circle, or whether you would reflect on that. No. Um, yeah, this is a really, really good point. Um, I, 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 I mentioned, right? <laughs> that, um, I guess, I mean, the short answer would be I would like to expand that category of theater studies to uh, ideally to, like, this is the thing I want to, I want to uh, conceive of this interdisciplinary performance studies thing that can account for all of these things and also have like a sub -perform performance studies small p that is the spectrum of the performing arts um, that includes uh, visual and performance art. Um, and so this is, this is quite limited. A, a category, but I absolutely believe, and I think, in fact, uh, performance studies or performance art um, and and visual art um, prompted the shift, prompted something of the shift in theater studies to performance. I mean, that was like very importantly the hinge is like how can you, how can we talk about this category which doesn't fit into um, this framework of you know what happens on a proscenium stage. Um, and so on and so forth. And I think even more in compellingly, when, we, when performance art is now entering the museum uh, via Marina Abramovich and, and so on and so forth, when it's becoming institutionalized, um, how does that also um, shift these, these, these boundaries? And um, uh, you know, the, 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 the critique is that when it goes into the gallery or when it is re repeated, it becomes theater. Uh, not performance, right? So there's all these um, debates, but you're absolutely right. That's important. Time for one or possibly two more questions or comments before we adjourn for hopefully some refreshments if you can stay. We don't have to, though. Okay, well, look. Uh, Exterminate the Brutes, and it's reduced to $7. And it says <clears throat> so many things about genocide and how it was um, supported by Darwin. And it just absolutely is an intellectual book. You'd enjoy it. And just to show how, ho how open and eclectic we are as a university, this is at the, U at the SFU bookstore? Uh, it is at the uh, Langara College. <laughs> <laughs> I think you said the UBC bookstore, right? <laughs> there we go. Well... Well, look, let me on your behalf thank uh, Peter Dickinson for just an amazing lecture, one that has somehow linked uh, performance with place, with politics. Uh, I can't imagine any other uh, uh, person who could have somehow managed to make a connection between the Olympic flame and Rob Ford flaming out. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think casting a lot of light and, uh, and, uh, and raising our awareness and, and raising a lot of questions for us about our space and about performance. And demonstrating, I think, uh, through both his talk and his performance that performance matters. So thank you very, very much, Peter. Thank you.